So hello there and welcome back to the final substantive part of the assignment journey. Today, myself and Naomi Bowers Joseph are going to be talking about referencing and proofreading your work, the final steps of the assignment journey before you click submit. So I am joined today, as I said, by special guest Naomi Bowers Joseph. Hello. Uh, Naomi is the Senior Skills Officer. She's been in many parts of this podcast. Check out the earlier episodes that she's in. So thank you for guest hosting an episode, the Organising Research episode. Naomi has lots of experience with referencing and actually wrote the referencing PowerPoint I use when I do my online referencing classes. So Naomi is a great guest to have for this particular episode. So getting right into it. first. I'm a great guest to have for all episodes. Thank you very much. Fair enough. So, getting it right into it, this podcast is going to be in two parts. First of all, proofreading and second of all, referencing. So, first of all, Naomi, when you're proofreading, what are the things that you would recommend checking? First off, very basic stuff. Make sure it makes sense. <laughs> I don't mean to be flippant with that. That's a really, a really important point. Make sure that your sentences make sense, um, that you've made the points that you want to make. So check it to make sure it says what you want it to say. I'm sure we're going to come back to this later, but um, it's so easy when you get caught up in writing to assume that it makes sense because it makes sense in your head. With proofreading, you need to make sure it makes sense on the paper as well. So there's that. Spelling, grammar, punctuation, good old spag. So with your first point that you said about, it's almost about the effect of the word, and that's something I check a lot when I'm proofreading, is I look at the meaning of the sentence and try and think how can I is this saying what I want to say but also is it saying what I want to say in as few words as possible yes and proofreading for me is always so tied up with getting under the word count I've never written an essay that's been under the word count first time round so going through and bringing it under the word count is a really good way of proofreading it if you do that at the same time so yeah Naomi you just revealed the two most common ver uses or purposes of proofreading which are getting your word count down, and also checking your spelling, punctuation, and grammar. Uh, so is there anything that you do in particular when you're checking your spelling, punctuation, and grammar? Uh, well, so in Word, you can use the spell checker. It, I, you shouldn't rely on the spell checker because it won't pick up words that are spelt wrong for the word you want, but still spell out another word correctly. But it's a, So don't just use the spell checker in Word, but it's a really good thing to run it and use it. And obviously that does grammar for you as well. Um, I would say as well is learn if you learn the way that you work and the common mistakes that you personally might make. So that will be different for everybody. For me, I's and E's the wrong way around. I am very bad at getting my I's and E's the right way around when I'm spelling words. So I know to look out for that. Um, and the number of times you can I proofread and then I'm repeating in my head I before E except after C. And then I have to do that every time. Is there a C there? No, so it's I before E. Um, and 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 that's something that I know that. So like I say, I can look out for all the E's and I's that I can see and make a conscious effort to check those. So I think that's really key. Yeah, I think it is important to look at your own personal things that you do quite often and try and fix them. But yeah me personally i think that proofreading is much more than just the two things that we've talked about already so i think it's much more than just checking your spelling punctuation and grammar and also getting your word count down those are two crucial parts of it but actually i think it's much more i think it's actually the final check that you've done what you are supposed to have done so you've hit the marking criteria and that's what i think is crucial about proofreading so i use it as a mm. final barrier and then I make edits to then make it hit the marking criteria and check it. So what do you think? So almost as if you were so you yourself were marking it, reading it from the perspective of the marker. Exactly. So I often look at each individual marking criteria and I turn them into questions. So when I said about in our first episode of this podcast, understanding the question, often we I, I said about doing that at the beginning. But then at the end, using that understanding of the question to question have I actually hit everything and sometimes you might have missed things which is just because you haven't checked but by checking you can then add them in which isn't always too difficult so in addition to checking the mark scheme one of the crucial things that you can do 
is go through your work and highlight where you've hit it. And I do that in different colors. So I look at the work that I've done and say, okay, where have I achieved this? And I mark it down that I've achieved that various criteria by doing ticks after it, which takes time, but it makes my work better than it would be before. That's very super organized, Alex. But again, this doesn't surprise me <laughs> about you. You're quite super organized about everything that you do. Yeah, no, good tip. That wouldn't have occurred to me. So that sounds really uh, idealistic, especially if you compare what I said in the last podcast. So I said in the last podcast, I made the frank admission that I don't always give uh, assignments as much time as I need to. So sometimes I am finishing them on the day of the deadline. But I do always give myself at least half a day when I am proofreading my work and by giving myself that time and hopefully if you can give yourself even more than that, depends on the assignment how much time I give myself, but if you do plan that time in, then you can check everything and have the time to make effect to those changes. Yeah. And the longer we've spoken sorry. And the longer you give yourself, the more you can check and change and make and make those changes necessary that are necessary. Yeah. We've spoken before, I know, on these things about um, giving yourself a proper break between finishing writing and starting reading it over. And I think it is about you get so immersed when you're writing something, so immersed in it that you know it makes sense because you know what you mean. You've just written it. So, of course, it makes sense. I um, always aim for a minimum of a sleep. So a, a, a night's sleep between having finished writing and starting to proofread. And it just gives you that mental break to come at it fresh and read it in a fresh state. Um, not just about being, um, ref it's useful to be refreshed as in not tired, but having that break away from having written it so that you can almost come at it as a different person, if that makes sense, yeah. um, to come and then read it. So when I, uh, a term that I heard uh, that describes that is reading it with fresh eyes. And that's something that Lord mm -hmm. Sugar said when I was watching The Apprentice when I was younger. And actually, it's a really good example. Love of The Apprentice. I love The Apprentice so much. It's one of my favourite programmes. So there's a really good example of this that happened in the past 10 minutes. So I submitted, well, so I, so I uploaded the latest top tips video on the YouTube channel. And it was pointed out to me that I made a grammar in that. And that's because I made it in one afternoon. So I made the PowerPoint. I did the video. And because I didn't, when I proofread, I didn't proofread it with fresh eyes. I did it all in one go in a rush. I didn't spot an error. But then I looked at today, having been told that I'd made an error, and I realised, wow, I've missed out a word. And I'll let you find that yourself. So check that video with proper eyes and examine it to find the mistake. And if you do find the mistake, um, then write in the comments. And yeah. So applying that to the academic context, how many times have you submitted a piece of work thinking it's perfect and then had it given back to you and had two or three mistakes um, pointed out by your lecturer? And then have you noticed that, well, they're so obvious. How have I made that mistake? Because you haven't read it with fresh eyes. And often, sometimes I had a piece of work back and that was only negative feedback. And they said, oh, there's a grammar error, isn't it? And I've got not 100. And in my eyes, I'm like, well, is that the only thing that's wrong with it? So make sure that you do give yourself time because they're the assignments where I haven't given myself enough time. And if you don't, if you can properly check it, then you can get the better mark. So, Naomi, um, have you, is there any digital tools that you know of it within Word, for example, that might be useful for proofreading? Why, Alex, thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so lots of digital tools in Word, including the spelling, the spell checker that we've spoken about previously, but also the read aloud function. So look at our videos on the accessibility features in Word, because um, we talk about it there. But it, it, Word will read your work back to you. So that's a really great way of picking up, particularly if sentences don't make sense. I guess spelling mistakes as well. If it can't mm. read a word to you, that might be an indication that you've spelled it wrong. I've never tried read aloud in Word with a misspelled word. That might be mm. something to try out, to see what it does. So I spoke um, to... But it can be... Yes, sorry. sorry. So I am um, Alana, my girlfriend, she finished her dissertation uh, last week. And when she finished it, she was using the read aloud tool and also the immersive reader feature with the line focus that we talk about in mm. another video. It'll pop up in the cards at this point if I'm clever. 
if you're listening on a podcast platform, then check it out on our YouTube channel. And she said that it was really useful because she spotted lots of things that she didn't know and it sped up the process quite a bit because rather than her reading it, it was a massive document, it was doing it a lot of it for her and she was just having to listen. So instead of using her eyes, she was using her ears. Yeah, I think also reading it aloud yourself. So we spoke mm. about this in our reading aloud live stream. Um, again, really useful tool. You'll pick up, or certainly I pick up so much more reading something out loud to myself than just reading it in my head, as it were, because you're using. I don't know if it's if this is this may not hold up to science. I don't know, but you're using so much more of your. Um, capabilities to go through so if you're reading in your head you're using your eyes and your brain but using your mouth as well your ears to hear it out again you just process it so more that may be complete fake science but that's how it feels to me um and i think that's a really helpful one as well and so if you really helpful with flow if you're stumbling over a sentence if you when you're reading it aloud cannot tell where the natural pauses are if it doesn't flow well if you're finding it difficult to vocalize that sentence have a look back and see if you can phrase it differently and speaking aloud is another great way to work that out as well how would if you wanted to explain that sentence to somebody else how would you say that say it out loud record yourself or think concentrate whilst you're doing it and then write that down instead yeah, I agree. That's really important. That's the way I actually put my comments into my work is I say it out loud and think, okay, where's the comma going to go? And that way I can work out where my natural pauses are. So exactly what you said. Mm. So Thanks. Alex, do you have any other advice for proofreading? I know um, you do. Yeah, so I have some advice. So I love to save words. And some of the ways that I say save words is by using synonyms. So I often, if a word or sentence uses too many words, I will try and look up synonyms for some of the words to try and make it save words. I also look at the tense. So By save words, do you mean to reduce your word count? So yes. you're saying the same thing, but with a smaller number of words. Yes. So a synonym is a word with the same meaning that can often change a term from being three words to sometimes one word. And do it enough times, you've saved... 50 to 100 words which you can then use for other things so light blue um is a the a cinnamon synonym it sounds like i want to say talk about cinnamon rolls mm -hmm. cinnamon, cin, cinnamon rolls a synonym for light blue would be cyan yeah. cyan is one word light blue is two words exactly. they mean the same thing exactly but fewer words so another thing that i do is i also change the tense of sentences so sometimes a sentence in a different tense that still works logically of course can save words so i often use ing i i make words so instead of saying to say i say saying and that will save a word and by doing that a lot it adds up and builds loads alex of you've really thought about this haven't you <laughs> i've preferred a lot of work to be honest <laughs> And going so going back to digital tools on Word again, Word will suggest making way to make your sentences sentences more concise. So certainly look at those suggestions that come up. But also be free to use your own creative ways. So another thing that I do at times, in addition to that, is I also use acronyms at times. And the reason why I say at times is because if you use a phrase a lot in an essay, and especially if it's a number of words. Or if it's like an organisation or a certain particular phrase, you can save quite a lot of words by turning that into an acronym. However, I would only recommend doing this with the words that you use a lot. And also, you have to define them, which costs a word. But too many acronyms in your work just becomes unreadable. <laughs> Yes, I, I agree with regards to organisations. So if you're talking about the World Health Organisation, for example, the first time you write that, you can put brackets WHO, close brackets, and then next time use WHO in, um, instead of writing out in full. I'm not sure I agree with phrases. That sounds to me, that sounds a bit like um, text speak. So if you start saying mm. um, LOL, don't write LOL in your assignments, people. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll give you an yeah, example. I, I, Yes, give me an example. So throughout this podcast, I have been talking about a particular question that I did about zero hours contracts. And in that particular assignment, I use ZHC for zero hour contract because I talked about that. I think it was over 100 times in my essay. My essay was only 2000 words 
or something like that. And that was acceptable because I literally had it in every other sentence and it saved me two words a time and that was fine. But it's just not doing it in abundance because sometimes lecturers don't like that, especially if it makes the work hard to read. But given the amount of times it occurred, it was okay. It was told it was okay to use. Mm, I'd be wary. I would really be wary about that. And but again, one. that's something you can check with your lecturer if yes. you're not sure, if you really think. Because it, do, it does sound to me like, yes, that was justified in that example. Like, I've never done that with a phrase, though, in that way, I don't think. But also, you can take your leads often from your course materials. So I'm guessing, Alex, your course materials use the phrase zero hours contracts quite a bit in them um, and books that you were reading. So take your lead from that if there's something that's being shortened to an acronym by your lecturer, by other authors in the field, then that will give you a clue that it might be OK to do um, yourself and your essay. Mm. So that is our advice for proofreading, but now we are going to listen to some students. So we ask students how long do they actually spend proofreading and also how long do they spend referencing. So let's listen to that now. So how long do you spend proofreading and how long do you spend referencing? Uh, I like to think I'm quite an organised student. I spend about two, uh, leave myself about two weeks before the deadline to proofread and to check my references just so, because bad spelling, grammar, punctuation has the potential to change the meaning of the question and ultimately that's going to have the potential also to change the mark that you come out with. Um, probably about an hour or so proofreading <laughs> and then I do my references as I go along. <laughs> so throughout the assignment. <laughs> I spend quite a bit of both on both just because uh, with proofreading when I'm gathering information I just don't focus on that referencing I just take the link and copy down in the document and I'll go back again and uh, I'll do that. Uh, I do my references as I go so they're normally on top of, on top of them and then uh, proofreading I try and leave a couple of days to do that but I also send it to a mate who's on a different course um, and she can check it for just general grammatical errors and spelling mistakes. I spend about an, an hour proofreading and I reference as I write my essay so I only have to do the uh, and bibliography at the end. So Naomi those are some interesting student voices. What did you think about those? I thought it was interesting how lots and lots of people saying that they reference as they go along, which is great. It's what we recommend. Um, I'm not sure I always did that as a student. Um, and very interesting as well, different attitudes towards the length of time spent proofreading, ranging from two weeks to an hour. I guess no one's spending two weeks solidly proofreading. Um, yes. It's about how long that process takes. And that's interesting as well, definitely. I would imagine that they would spend time doing different drafts, so proofreading would be they finish the first draft and then check it and change it. Mm. I can't say I've ever spent two weeks proofreading a piece of work. I think the most I've ever spent is two days. But the bigger the work, maybe the more long, more time you might spend on it. Um, yes. So I think it was also very interesting to hear about how students differed in their approach but one thing that I did hear a student say is about the fact that they help other people with their proofreading so what do you think about other people proofreading work so I'm going to give you two answers to this the first from my perspective when I was studying and the second since my perspective since I've been working in the skills team and I have thought about it and read other people's views on it so when I was a student every single assignment that I did went past my dad um, absolutely everything I wrote before I submitted it, it went to my dad, he read over it for me and um, commented on this. It was, it was spelling and grammar, but he'd also pick up if things didn't make sense as well. Um, I think what was really key about the student that said this in the um, voices that you just played is that they are asking someone on a different course to look over it for them. And that I think is really key for lots of reasons. But some of the things that we've, so proofreading comes up a lot in the skills service. We get a lot of requests from students to ask if we can proofread their work. We get requests if we can do the proofreading ourselves, if we can recommend proofreading services. And it's a really key thing. We can't proofread entire pieces of work from students. Part of that is a time issue. We've not got the resources to do that. But the main thing is this issue of academic integrity. So when you submit your work, it needs to be your work. So it cannot have been written by anybody else, either in full, but also in part. It all needs to be your own work. 
So what I would say with getting other people to proofread your work is make sure that the words themselves are still yours. So a good rule of thumb is to get ask someone to point out where they think improvement needs to be made but you do the changes. So it's the positive and the negative side of, of the action. They can point out the negative, this needs to change. You're doing the positive rewording it or respelling it or whatever. Another um, way of managing that would be to, I know everything's electronic at the moment and particularly given we're not um, seeing many people at the moment, it's difficult to do things in paper form, but if you've got the, um, if you've got the ability to do it in paper form, print it out and give it to someone to proofread so they can mark on the paper, say with a pen or a highlighter, this needs changing. But you've got that electronic copy and you can go and make those electronic changes. Or again, if you're doing it by email, email them the file, um, but don't just accept that. Don't let them make changes and send it back to you. You keep your original file and you make the changes to that. And those are really good rules of thumb to make sure that that work that you are submitting is yours. And the reason this is key, sorry, I'm talking a lot about this now. The reason this is key comes back to what Alex was, Alex was saying earlier about because you can lose marks on your spelling and punctuation and grammar. There is part of what you are being marked on. So it's imperative that it's your work and not someone else having done it for you. I agree with that as well. I think the key part of what you said is about the fact that it's on someone else's course. So sorry, is that it's from someone on a different course. I think that is crucial because if you're asking someone on the same course as you, one, they could copy some of your work and steal some of your references, and two, they might be doing the same assignment, but also they might try and change, change your words and change what your arguments are, whereas if you give it to someone who's a complete outsider to the subject who doesn't understand the area, they will only be able to check your spelling, punctuation, grammar, and maybe some of the skills bits. Okay, you haven't explained this, so I don't get this. Yes, if you send it to someone on your same course, they will know what you're talking about. So there might be something you've not explained clearly, but because they know what you mean, they, they might not pick up on that. Sending it to someone that's got no knowledge of the subject, they, they will pick up when you've not explained something as fully as you need to, may, maybe. So as a minimum, I would send it to someone on a different course to you, or a parent, a sibling, or someone who doesn't have that knowledge of the area. Um, but I do think it is very useful because, as we talked about earlier with fresh eyes, people who proofread to work with someone else, they will have that fresh eyes to spot the error. So the error I talked about earlier, it was spotted by my manager, Tim, who I don't think is going to be in this podcast, but you'll see him on the other videos on the channel. He spotted that because he had fresh eyes. He hadn't read it before. So he was then more critical of it. But the more you read it, the more chance there is for mistakes. So some of the students in that podcast or in those recordings were talking about referencing and the fact that they reference as they go on. And that is something which I think is crucial to referencing. So now we're going to talk about referencing and different ways you can do that. So I think the first and most fundamental question to ask about referencing is, to look at why we actually do bother referencing. So Naomi, why, why do we do it? So again, we've got positive and negative reasons for referencing. So when we talk to students in person um, or over email or whatever, when we talk to students about referencing, people obviously often think about the negative reasons why they need to reference. And by that, I mean the sort, the sort of scary ones get very worried about it and quite you know often very legitimately people are worried about their turnitin scores they're worried their percentage is going to be too high people are worried that they might open themselves up to accusations of plagiarism um there's 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 a lot of worry going on so people want to reference properly to avoid negative things and that is that is a very good reason you don't want to um have accusations of plagiarism leveled at you. You you really don't. Um, so that is key. But there's also loads of positive reasons to mm. reference. And if you focus on those, you will you'll achieve the aim of not um not plagiarizing mm. or not being open yourself to accusations of plagiarism. But focusing on the positive is just a happier way of going about it really. So those reasons are things like you're giving other people credit for their work. If you do work, you want credit for that. Referencing lets you give credit to other people for their for their work. 
it lets you demonstrate your critical thinking. So if you have done some critical thinking that's your thoughts, you need to be able to separate that from what you've read. So if you've read something, someone else's thoughts, ideas, and then you have done some critical thinking about that, you need to be able to distinguish this is what they have said and this is what I have thought about it. And referencing lets you do that because you're making it very clear that this is the bit that someone else thought. And then therefore the next bit um, is the bit that you've thought. We talk about um, the paragraph structure being point, evidence, explain. So you make the point, you've got your evidence, what someone else has thought, and that explanation is yours. So referencing lets you really make it clear that you're adhering to that kind of structure that you've organized yourself in that way. And it really does give you authority for what you're saying and a trick which yes. I often use in my referencing sessions, but actually it's a trick that you made yourself, Naomi, is when we talk about the reasons about why we reference, we then put up on the screen a source that says what those reasons are or says that these people made this and it just gives you that authority. And yeah, it's that's what lets you see when they see references. They will see that you've actually done the research and it highlights that wider reading, which is a criteria of a first. And so really, it's really, really positive, isn't it? Yeah. So if you've gone away and read 20 journal articles and 52 books and billions of newspaper articles, I may be exaggerating there. But if you've, if you've gone away and done your research, you've done a lot of reading, why wouldn't you want to shout about the fact that you have done all that? Referencing lets you say, look, look right here. I have done some reading. This is the proof. And if you don't reference, you're, the person marking the essay won't necessarily know that you've gone and done all that hard work. I think there's great pride to be taken from a very long reference list. <laughs> Because <laughs> yes. it, it, that reference list at the end of your work is a visual representation of the work you've done when you were reading all those articles and books. And it's really key to have it in there. As long as those are relevant references. So you talked just yes. about reference list. So there's two different types of things, isn't there? There's cite, in-text citation and then there's a reference list. So what is the difference between the two? Yes, we talk about citing and referencing, and it can often be um, a, just used as a phrase, citing and referencing, but they are two very distinct things. Citing is an in-text citation. So in the text of your essay, you put a citation in, and that makes it clear this bit here that I've quoted or summarised, we're going to talk about that in a bit, is the idea of someone else. And then you've got referencing, which is at the end of your work, you create a reference list that lists out the full bibliographic details of all the works that you've used. And the purposes are very different. So the purpose of your citation in the text is to say this is someone else's idea and this is that person. And in the in the reference list at the end, the purpose is to allow your reader to track down that um that work if they want to follow it up or to prove to show that you have you know actually read it and that it is a real thing I think um, that's quite fundamental yeah that's not um, all the purpose isn't it maybe yeah, so that lets you can find it so that other well so yeah so that other people can read what you've read and it's a technique that people talk about when they are talking about how they look for articles um looking at the reference lists of the you find a journal article that's relevant and then you look at that reference list to find further things you might read um it all ties together um yeah and so they're both really important but they are actually very different things and you need to approach them both sort of separately so some students will be also asked to use a bibliography in footnotes which is what i was asked to use when i was a student because i used our scholar mm -hmm. referencing rather than harvard or apa or any of those and those are quite similar in effect. So bibliography, the only difference between that and a reference list is that it contains all the information of all the sources that you've read, not just the ones you put into your thing, but the ones you've read as well. And the instead of using in-text citations, you just apply a footnote and then you put essentially all the reference information inside the footnotes themselves, which I think is really useful. Um, and when I was learning Harvard to get, when I, was, when I had this job, I was confused about why people waste words and put citations in in text. It's like a tax on your uh, words, but it shows where you've read things is what I've established with that. 
Yeah. And I think there are some courses that might want both a reference list and a bibliography. And I think it's worth restating the difference between those. So a reference list is the list of all the references that you have cited in text. So everything that you have written about in your text and put a citation in needs to go into your reference list. A bibliography is everything that you've read. So it can include sources that you have read and have informed your general thinking on the subject or led you towards other sources, but that you haven't directly used in your text. So most assignments in my experience will just want a reference list. Um, Although, Alex, were you saying in law you needed a bibliography at the end yes. to complement your footnotes? Yeah, it's worth checking if you're not sure what is required. Um, so, it, like I say, you might you might read a source that is relevant to your work, but not directly relevant to the question, say. So you've read that source and you've maybe used the reference list there to find other sources that you so you've, you've made good use of it you've used it but you've not actually directly used that in your work and that's when it would go in a bibliography rather than in a reference list so i think what's important if what you were saying before is it adapting to the individual assignment so looking at what your assignment brief is looking at your course and adapting it. and that's the thing that we highlighted in episode one of this podcast in understanding the question Go check that episode out for more information about that. But really do change the way that you approach any assignment or any referencing to that question by you looking at the assignment brief and your module information. So we've talked about citing in text, but when you cite, you cite one of three things, essentially, when you're in, in text. A quote, a paraphrase, or when you summarise a text. So Naomi, what are the differences between the three? So quoting is when you replicate word for word what someone said. So copy and paste, to use the technological term. Um, it's when you, like I say, you take a sentence or a couple of sentences or, or a paragraph possibly, but normally a sentence or a couple of sentences or even a word, um, and you put it word for word in your assignment. That as a quote needs quotation marks around it. So you need to use a quotation mark at the beginning and at the end of that quote to make it really clear, this is not my word, this is someone else's word. And that citation then to say whose words they were. Paraphrasing is when you take an idea and put it into your own words. So there's an idea that someone else has written about. You don't, you're not putting it word for word into your um, your assignment, but you're saying basically those points in your own words. And that again, it needs a citation. And in Harvard referencing, certainly both a quote and a paraphrase will need a page number. So you will need to put the page number in um, of the page where that idea came from, whether it's a direct quote or a paraphrase. Summarizing is, I want to say it's summarizing, it's summarizing, it's taking a larger piece of um, work or an idea that, that's, that's longer and shortening it down. So you're still retaining the meaning of it, but it's a summary rather than putting it into your own words. So you will be putting it into your own words. I don't think I'm making sense here. You will be putting it into your own words, but you'll be summarising it as well as you go along. So, um, and often that can be an idea, maybe that a concept that's talked about throughout an entire work, throughout an entire book or an entire journal article. You can summarise that in maybe a paragraph or a line or two, and then you will need your citation. But again, in Harvard, you won't need the page number for that bit because it relates to the whole work. So two ways that I summarised as a student, or two ways that I've heard that you can summarise as a student, is, for example, in law, I would often read long cases, and instead of quoting the, a page or a, way it's a lot of pages, I would just say, this is the judgment of the case. So I'd summarise that entire case into one individual um, idea. Or sometimes when you've read a journal, this is the point of the journal, this is what they found, the entire... Um, that would be, you could say, this is what the journal found. This is what they argued in this journal. But that's not come from a specific page. That's come throughout the entire thing. Um, so that could be two ways that you might summarise. So Naomi, which one do you think is better? Paraphrasing, summarising and quoting? 
I, well, I don't think you can call it. It'll depend completely on the context, what you're trying to achieve and what your word count is. And um, yeah, absolutely. The context, there will be times when what I would say is I would never try and feel like I was forcing myself to put something into my own words if the direct quote says it and sums mm. it up. If there's no other sensible way of saying something, then I would use a direct quote. If However, you think you could really demonstrate a bit more understanding of a point by putting it into your own words, because that's the beauty of paraphrasing. It lets you demonstrate that you have understood what that person's saying. And that's again, that's invaluable um, when you're when you're having an essay marked to be able to demonstrate that you've actually understood what you've read is is a great thing to be able to do. So that's when paraphrasing can really come into its own and summarizing. Again, you're not going to want to write out um, point by point what someone's this process someone's gone through, say, um, in a study or a research um, article. But being able to summarize it just into a sentence or two can be really helpful so it can depend on lots of factors uh, the flow of your essay again it might flow better to put a quote or to put a paraphrase in um whether it's a really key point to what you're saying if it's a major author and this is a really key point to the argument you're making you might want to do a direct quote if it's something that sort of backs up the third or fourth source you found that backs up the same point you just want to do a quick summarize really going to depend they're all they're all wonderful things to do yeah i agree uh, I always prefer paraphrasing where I can do, but quite often, especially in my area, I would often quote specific words, especially when then words have power and changing yes. those words might affect the meaning of the sentence. Um, what we're talking here about when you're quoting something, what, what happens when you quote something where the author is quoting from another book? So that's, that's something called secondary referencing. So Naomi, can you secondary reference? Yes. We get asked about this a lot as well, don't we, Alex? Certainly about how the how to how to do secondary referencing. So yes, um, I have found this certainly when I was studying. You find a book that was published quite recently, say you look at it, then they've um, either quoted or they've paraphrased or summarised another source that was written beforehand, and you think that's it, that source right there is really key. I want that one. So with full enthusiasm, you try and get hold of mm -hmm. that original source. And sometimes you just can't. Sometimes you just can't. And it's really frustrating for whatever reason. And trying to get hold of articles is a topic for another day. Um, we have to get an academic librarian to talk to us about that. Well, just but check out sometimes... the research. Check out the podcast that we did earlier about research and finding sources, which is part, yes. I believe it's part three of this series. There we go. Um, so some, sometimes it... you just can't find that original source, but you still want to use the point and you can do that. I think definitely try and get hold of the original source if you can. If you can't, you reference it as secondary referencing. And you do that by, it, it depends on the referencing style, how you do that. But certainly you can put Smith quoted in Brown, for example, um, into, your, um, into your work. But make sure that you don't pretend to have read something that you haven't. Yeah. So in your reference list, you need to put the work that you have read in there um, rather than the work you haven't. So that's all good. But for more information about citing, about secondary referencing and the place where we actually get all of our reference information, I'd recommend checking a tool that the university pays for called Cite Them Right. So this is an amazing thing. It basically answers all the referencing questions that we ever get. Um, and there's a book version and there's an online version. So you can find it on find some information and I think it's indexed in databases. You can then find site and write. Uh, if you've got university login, it logs you into it. And basically you can find information on it. There is another YouTube video on this channel. Or if you are watching on a podcast, listening on a podcast site, you can check this out uh, by going onto a YouTube channel and searching Derby in library. There is a referencing video where I talk about how to use site and write. But definitely second, secondly referencing, there's information on how you do that on the basics tab, as well as also how you cite anything in any type. So whether you're citing with Harvard, APA, or anything else, it'll all be good. So yeah, I definitely recommend checking out Cite Them Right, um, because it answers all, all of your questions. So yeah, what do you think about Cite Them Right, Naomi? 
What do I think about sight them right? I think it's great. There are lots of different ways to get to sight them right. Um, you've mentioned a couple of them. We it's one of those things we've really tried to make as easy as possible to get to. So we have a citing and referencing skills guide. There's a link to cite them right in there. You can get to it by searching the library catalogue for cite them right. You can get to it by searching library plus for cite them right. Basically, if you go on any kind of library system, it's worth typing cite them right into a search box to see if you can get in that way. Um, or like as Alex was saying, there's direct links to it as well. Really key resource and bookmark it, I would say, on your computer, bookmark mm -hmm. it, and then it's there. It can do all sorts of things. It's got general information on referencing. It's got specifics on referencing so many different types of sources. I have never found anything that anyone's asked me that we have not been able to find on site them right. So, for example, um, Snapchat. personal communication, emails from your lecturer, for example, Snapchat, um, graffiti is there, YouTube videos, people ask about those, it's all there on Cite Them Right. Again, there's a search box within Cite Them Right, type in what you want to reference and see what comes up. It covers lots of the main um, referencing systems. There's a drop down menu so you can drop down and select which referencing system you are using. That's great. It's got lots of little nifty tools. So there's a tool that helps you construct your reference where you can over type um, I use this, um, I leave it, it puts together a reference where it says sort of surname, yeah. comma, year, it gives you a standard, brackets, doesn't it? whatever. So I, huh? It gives you like a standard type precedent thing that you can adapt. Yes, so I would I use that by leaving all the punctuation in place and just deleting out the words and putting in the bits mm. from my own reference and then you can email it to you yourself you can copy and paste it really really useful tool can't recommend it enough um and do as alex was saying check out the information we've got about how to use that and if you've got any questions then get in touch with the library and we can talk you through how to use that as well so if i'm clever it should have come up with a card on youtube currently saying with a link to that tutorial but of course you're known. clever alex so thanks so site the right is a really useful tool uh, because it gives you all the information you need to find within a, a journal or a book. But where do you find the information? So, Naomi, if you were reading a book, where would you find the reference information inside the book? So, um, often in a physical book or in an e-book, they will be on the same to the same place because ebooks are generally representations of the physical book. Um, you're looking very near the front, inside the front cover in the first few pages you will often find a lot of information like um, year of publication, place of publication. Don't get me started on place of publication. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of information there. Obviously, the title page, the cover page of the book will give you authors. Often it will give you editions. It will give you the title. Um, so you can look at all that. And we've talked and our student voices said a lot about referencing as you go along. So when you and we talked about this in reference management as well in the um, one of the previous podcasts, when you've got that source in front of you, write down the information if you can. But then also, if you haven't done that, if you have sent the book back to the library, at the moment, the libraries are closed, so we can't get um, print books out of the libraries at the moment. If you're in that situation, for whatever reason, you can't get back the book or the, um, the journal that you've used, you can generally find most of that information online. So if you search our library catalogue, so on the library homepage, click on catalogue, search the catalogue for a print book, Generally, all that bibliographic information is there on the catalogue, so you should be able to pull it out from there. Again, with journals, if you search Library Plus for a journal, you should be able to find all the information you need on the record in Library Plus without having to actually get the um, the full article again. And journal articles, again, I do this in the presentation we use. Actually, I think it's quite confusing often to find the information you need from the journal article mm. itself. Much easier, I find it much easier to use the record in a database like Library Plus um, because it's all pulled together for you there. So that's where I would look. That's where I find mine as well. I don't actually find it in the journal quite often. I find, except for the page number uh, referencing. Yeah. But the actual um, referencing details for the journal, I found it on the library search and the library plus part the ab where the abstract is. Mm. Um, websites can be tricky to find information actually sometimes. Um, websites with individual authors is always one that strikes 
fear and not fear but i i don't like referencing websites with individual authors but again often if you scroll down to the bottom of a page it might say who an author is that's always a good place to look um if you're looking at something on a mobile device often you might not get the full information but there are often options to view it in the mm. desktop view on your mobile um device so that can be useful for just those little small print bits like that they cut out of the mobile view see if you can modify it manually to view the desktop view instead and you might see more information so those are some really good tips for where you find the information but let's talk about some more general referencing tips as well as that so my first tip that i give for referencing is all about being organized so following the advice that naomi gave in the podcast about organizing your research and using those digital tools like endnote as you go, I would recommend keeping a record of potentially useful sources as you find them. So what do you think about that, Naomi? Yes, absolutely. It's the kind of thing that's that's really great and is, I would say, is the ideal to strive for. Um, I, as a student, often fail to meet that ideal and then you have to think of other ways of dealing with that. But yes, if that's possible, then absolutely do it. And it, I think sometimes um, that's something you just learn by experience. So after you've done a couple of assignments, or certainly after I'd done a couple of assignments and thought, oh, that would have been really useful if I'd have made note of my references as I went along. Um, then I started doing it with my later ones and it makes a huge difference. Have you got any other advice then you give for referencing? For referencing? I I think it comes back again to this, these, these positive and negative reasons for doing it. Try and focus on those positive reasons for doing it. Think about what you are adding to your work by referencing properly and try not to dwell so much on what you're worried about if you don't reference properly. Because that just that shift in mindset just makes for a happier day apart from anything else. And it gives you that motivation to do it properly. Um, but don't get too hung up about it. Um, it's it's difficult because there are sometimes there are absolute right and wrongs with it. Sometimes there aren't. Sometimes there are grey areas. Sometimes you are going to disagree with other people about how something should be referenced. And they're just, I think we sometimes just need to accept that. Be consistent, though. Mm. That's a really key thing. If you if there's something that's a bit ambiguous about how you should reference it and you've but you've made a decision, you've asked for advice, you've checked with the lecturer, you've seen what they've got to say reference it that way and then when that comes up again either with that same source or with a different source that's that's got the same issue make the same decision decision again be consistent with your referencing and that's really key so there's two things there both being positive and remembering the positive reasons why you do reference and also the being consistent which i think are both are crucial uh what i would also add to that is also being patient so remembering that referencing does take time and mm. giving it that time uh, just as you have proofreading time, give reference in the time, just so you can make sure you get every little detail right. So, is there any other piece of advice that you want to give, Naomi? I don't think so. I think I've exhausted my well of referencing advice. Fair enough. I have one more, which actually is something that you said when we did a school visit together. Um, it's all about being thorough. And to quote yourself in the past, the devil of the referencing is in the detail. So making sure that you do get the little bit of details right, because there's so... There's such little things about where you put the full stops, um, the order that the references are in. Just make sure that you've got them correct, you've checked all of them over, especially if you're using an online referencing tool. Make sure to double check them um, and that they are right, and at least that you've been consistent. But Definitely. number one is being right, number two is then being consistently nearly right. So try and make sure you can be right if possible. So... That is all the advice I have for referencing, um, and that is also nearly the end of the entire podcast. So Is it really? The whole series? Yeah, so the series has two more episodes. So one episode where we're going to summarise the assignment process down into one shorter episode where we talk about the key learnings in each episode of the podcast, oh, and really grief. we reflect Am on I in that one? I think I am, aren't I? You're invited to it. We'll see if you are on the day. Um, <laughs> Depends if I decide to ban you or not by that point. <laughs> um, and if I get the technology working with three of us. But, so that is all going to all be about uh, reflecting on it. That's the final episode of the main series. But also, because of the fact that the podcast is seemingly getting some views, uh, I've decided that I'm going to try and do the bonus episode 
um, which is all about reflecting on your assignment once you've submitted it and got your feedback. So I'll see about those. So those should be coming out in the near future. Or if you're listening when this has already come out, these will already be up and available on YouTube and podcasting platforms. Um, it's like a form of time travel, this, isn't it? Because people might be listening when it's uploaded, but they might be listening, you know, years from now. Yes. People might be talking in hushed voices about the Assignment Journey podcast and going and listening to it. So speaking about people listening years in advance, um, as with the last podcast, I will apologise for the slight downgrading quality compared to the usual um, system. That is because of the current situation, given that the we're working from home currently, and so we're using Teams for this podcast. So yes, apologies for the downgrading quality due to the current situation, and hopefully I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you very much for listening, and have a nice day. Bye! Bye. And also special thanks to the student voices, and also Naomi for being my special guest, again. I'm always happy to be your special guest, Alex.